Remember, I kind of feel like I've come home too. <laughs> now you don't understand. Every time I come here, something happens deep in my soul. I don't understand what always goes on. I'm not a rookie, but something happens deep inside of me every time I come here. Perhaps the Lord is saying at some time you need to come for longer than a week or two. Perhaps that's what he's saying. Pastor Rene, before the service, kept apologizing to me, saying, we have videos, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But when I saw, I've never seen a wedding like that. <laughs> and I've never seen a baptism like that. Uh, but when I saw some of the people involved, I kept asking my daughter, I said, is that who we sent materials to? One time when Julie was home, I think just about every time, she walks through our church, looks in closets and in corners. One day she said, Dad, you have so much literature you're not using. What are you going to do with it? I said, I have no idea. She said, I have an idea. Why don't we box it up and send it to our friends in the Philippines? So we did. And uh, some of the people that were there are some of the people that we have sent literature to. So we have had a small little part. I can't wait to go home and tell our people, I saw in action the people that we have sent materials to. And uh, it'll be a great blessing. I want you to know that right now, and probably for the past hour or two, literally across America, people are praying for this service. Because everyone that I talk to on Facebook or on the phone, I've said, Sunday morning I'll be preaching at Lighthouse in Hong Kong. That's Saturday night. So before you go to bed, pray that God will touch us at Lighthouse. So from literally, I know all over Baltimore, where I'm from, and literally across America, People have prayed and asked God to bless you this Sunday morning. I think that's significant. I think that's special. It's good to be here with your pastors, Pastor Jennifer and Pastor Renee. I have the utmost respect for them, just the utmost love and respect. It's good to be with uh, my friend and colleague, Pastor Curtis Silcox. I think so highly of him. I enjoy hearing him preach so much that uh, I asked him repeatedly, would you like to take my place? And he kept saying, no, 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 you, you. <laughs> so here I am. Here I am. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 137. While you're turning, let me also say my wife brings you greetings. And uh, she enjoyed being with you back in the summer so very much before she went to English camp. And... Uh, that experience just touched her life so very, very much. And we thank God for this privilege. Amen. I want to preach for a few minutes until, uh, or until I'm done. I mean, you know. <laughs> I know they told me a time limit, but you see, they will have to drag me off. Yes. So <laughs> I will preach till I'm done. And it's always good to be among the people who stole my daughter's heart. You people stole my daughter's heart. And uh, so it's good to be among people of like faith this morning. In Psalm 137, starting at verse 1, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. And listen to the words. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there were those who carried us away captive, asked for us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And then they replied, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Let's pray and then we'll preach. Father, we love you this morning. I thank you, God, for this privilege that you've given me, this awesome privilege. I pray, God, not that I'll be eloquent. 
I pray that every, I'm not asking for every word to be grammatically correct, but I'm praying this morning that you would let the word of God be effective and powerful in our lives. God, when they have forgotten my name, let them remember the message and let it be strength to our souls and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. For just a few minutes, I want to talk about, to preach about singing the Lord's song. Singing the Lord's song. Now the Psalms, as you know in the Psalter, are worship poems of the nation of Israel. Each of them, in their own unique way, tells something of the trials and the tragedies and the triumphs of the people of God. They were, or these are, what you would call liturgical or religious prayers that span the whole realm of human emotion and experience. When you read the Psalms, you read Psalms when the writer was angry. You read Psalms when they were happy and celebrating. These are hymns, many of them if not most, that were set to music to describe God's people coping with life and longing for a loving and a living encounter with Him. The Psalms, just for a little background, spread chronologically from about 961 B.C. to about 200 B.C. when they reached their final compilation. And in them we find the stories and the reflections of Israel's rise and of Israel's fall. Now to be sure, the Psalms in the Psalter have Psalms of celebration, like Psalm 8.1, where it reads. Now, I may read something a little different than what you see up here. Pay attention. Maybe I'll just turn and read it there. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Like Psalm 1.9, where it says, Lord, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvelous works. Like Psalm 24, verses 1 and 7. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all that dwell therein. Like, there are psalms of testimony, like Psalms 121, 124, where it says, If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, now Israel may say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us up as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. There are psalms of personal commitment to praise. Psalms like Psalm 103 and verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. There are psalms of ascent when the pilgrims would sing on their way to celebrate in Jerusalem. Like Psalm 122 in verse 1 where he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. By the way, that verse is one of the first psalms other than the 23rd psalm that I ever remember because when I was a little boy, I remember every Sunday they would recite that, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now I'm not a little boy anymore, but every single Sunday that comes around, I'm glad when it's time to come into the house of the Lord. I'm glad to go to Lansdowne where I where I pastor. I'm glad to come here where I pa where where I don't pastor where I preach and and fellowship and enjoy. That was a real slip. I didn't mean that, pastor. There was no intent meant there, none whatsoever. Edit that part right there. Take that part out. But that, I'm glad to come to that. I need to move on. Indeed, there are psalms of celebration. Like Psalm 148, verses 1 through 4. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him all His angels. Praise ye Him all His hosts. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all ye stars of light. Praise Him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. There's Psalm 150 in verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. But... When you remember the text that I read, praise and celebration 
is about as far removed as the east is from the west when you look at Psalm 137. Because Psalm 137 is not a psalm of celebration. It's a psalm of captivity. Psalm 137 was not a psalm that was lived out in Jerusalem, but it was a psalm that was lived out in Babylon. Psalm 137 was not a psalm that was recited in the temple. It was indeed lived out by a lonely river in Babylon. As a matter of fact, we pick up in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, let me tell you what was happening just a little bit. In 597 B.C., a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, that's a big name, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Chaldeans, some may say Chaldeans, Chaldeans, had made a final invasion in Israel over and through Jerusalem. And he captured the city of Jerusalem. And he led those who survived away from that invasion into captivity, into a foreign land into a place called Babylon. In 2 Kings 25 and 2 Kings 36, they, or 2 Chronicles 36, they detail this invasion. And they begin to tell and, and detail the captivity that ensued after the invasion. Day by day and hour by hour, for months and for even years, God's people had abandoned him and, and had gone after other gods after foreign gods with eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear. And in fact, it was so bad that if we look into 2 Chronicles, the word of the Lord tells, it, tells us this in verses 14 through 16. Moreover, all the chief of the priest and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, and they despised his words, and they misused or abused his prophets until the wrath of God rose up against his people till there was no remedy. It happened so bad. They had disobeyed so long. There was no remedy. Even the kings, several successions of kings that had come to the throne did evil in the sight of, of the Lord. So God finally raised up this king Nebuchadnezzar who became an instrument of judgment and the Chaldeans and allowed him to invade the land of Israel. They came and they viciously and horribly wreaked havoc through the land of Israel and particularly in the city of Jerusalem. They broke down the walls of Jerusalem. They burned the palace with fire. They burned the goodly vessels thereof. They burned the temple. They stole the possessions. They slew all the young men in the sanctuary with a sword. Now, to get a, an up-to-date or a more modern picture, think of the killing fields of Cambodia. Think of the mosquito-infested correction camps in Siberia. Think of the horrible concentration camps in World War II. And you begin to get an idea of the brutal savagery that took place at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, it was so savage that when you read the account, they took King Zedekiah and they, just before they poked out his eyes, they slaughtered his own sons in cold blood. So the last thing he would remember seeing was the sight of his sons being slaughtered. It was a horrible time. Those that survived, they took those that survived, except for the very poor, and they deported them to the city of Babylon to live as prisoners of war, to live isolated, incarcerated, away from home in abject servitude. They lived there for more than 70 years. Now if Jerusalem represented the songs and the saints and the salvation, Babylon represented everything that was vile, all that was vain, all that is vexing. 
Think about how vain the city of Babylon was. It was a city that was built 15 miles in circumference, 60 miles altogether. It was a city that was surrounded by a wall 350 feet high. 300 feet thick at the top and 700 feet thick at the bottom. Inside the outer wall was an inner wall that it was 200 feet high. On the top of the wall there were soldiers stationed. They were manning hot kettles of lead. They were ready to pour that on anybody who tried to escape or anybody who would try to come in and invade. Inside, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a little gruesome time here to, to come to where we're going to sing. Inside the city, 150 pillars held up a pagan temple to a god called Baal. The palace in Babylon, just the dining room, was 5,280 feet in length. It was a city that was built to vanity. It was a city that was also dedicated to vileness. Every kind of sin and perversion that one could imagine was the lifestyle of those that were there. It was vile. It was vain. And then it became vexing to those who were living there as prisoners of war. They were there to serve the king of Babylon. They'd been stripped of their names, stripped of their culture, stripped of their identity. And now they were in forced labor. And it was on one of those days that we read verse 1 of our text. By the rivers of Babylon, that vile city, they've been invaded, they've been hauled away captive. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, some have said it was really one of the canals, man-made canals, that connected the Tigris River on one side and the Euphrates River on the other side of Babylon. These connecting canals. It was by one of those canals we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. I want you to hear the misery. I want you to capture the pathos of captivity as now their misery is compounded by the fact that not only are they captive, but now they've been, they, 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 uh, now they have memories of Zion. They remembered how it used to be in Jerusalem. They remembered how it used to be in the temple of God, God's resting place, the place that God chose to put his name, the place where they celebrated the feast, the place where they heard the law, the place where they worshiped, the place where they communed with God. They remembered how they had worshiped. They remembered the festivities. They remembered their families. They remembered home. And tired tears began to fill their eyes as they wept. But not only was their, memory, was their misery from their memories, but their misery was compounded by their mockers. Now, it's one thing to be in misery, but if somebody's mocking you when you're in misery, if you've ever been sad and somebody knew you were sad and they mocked you, for your sadness. Wow, I can't even imagine that. But that's what was going on. You see, while that happened, those that held them captive looked at them and they said mockingly, Okay, now, now, sing us one of those songs you used to sing. Let's hear you sing how you used to sing now. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm starting to feel the presence of God. Listen, sometimes the enemy will come to you when things aren't going well, and he'll say, now let me hear you sing. Now let me hear you. Well, let me watch you now raise your hands. You've just gone through all kind of chaos. Families in disorder. Finances are bad. Health is not good. Now sing a song. You want to know how to defeat the enemy? You raise your hands right then. You lift up your voice in praise right then. And watch victory come. Amen. Amen and amen. But they looked at him and they said, How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I can almost imagine their eyes are bloodshot. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And isn't that what happens sometimes? Now I'm going to speak a little bit about where I'm from. Isn't that exactly almost what happens in the church today? The world, the flesh, 
and even the devil are demanding something from us now that for some reason many can no longer produce. You see, we live in a culture that's filled with vileness and vulgarity, and it turns its attention to the house of, the, of God. And unfortunately, many times, it's a pale, it's a weak, and it's an anemic church. And, and, and they say, go ahead now. Sing us one of those old songs like your saints used to do. Those songs of victory like you used to sing. Go ahead. Where are your miracles now? Where are the good things that your God was supposed to do for you? And the church sometimes finds itself in a counterculture called upon to sing the song of the Lord in a strange land. I don't know if you follow the news. Probably you do. But uh, we live in a strange land. And it's not just in America. It's right here. Let me just divert for just a moment and tell what I bragged on you about. I have been here and come earlier than I got here today. And, and at least twice have come and sat when you prayed. And, and I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Sister Pastor Jennifer or Pastor Renee. But during those days, for days, my daughter, God bless her heart, had walked me to death. In Hong Kong. I mean just wa walk me to death. And I would come in here just ready to relax. Just let me just sit down. Walk everywhere. And, uh, but I would come in here. And you would be praying before service. And as I would walked around Hong Kong. I noticed every kind of lifestyle you want to mention. Every kind of evil you wanted to see. Many pretty things, many nice things, many fascinating things, but every kind of evil that you can imagine. And you live with it every day. I don't even have to go into detail. You know what I'm talking about. But I would come in here, and I went back home, and I told my church, I said, those people would gather to pray. No one talked. They prayed, and I said, it seemed to me as though about 120 or 150 pieces of light were piercing up into the darkness and going up into heaven. And I thought, my, we live in a culture that just doesn't regard us. But that church sends out those lights of prayer every single Sunday. And no doubt, every single day. And we live in a strange world. We live in a strange world. When you realize that at least where I'm from, one out of two marriages end in divorce. And a child growing up in America today has a 60% chance of spending time in a fatherless home before they reach the age of 16. It's a strange land. When we look at hunger, it's a strange world when we have abundance and others can't even fix their roof. It's a strange land when we have food that we throw out and others go to bed hungry. It's a strange land. It's a strange land when we look at the AIDS epidemic, when you look at the proliferation of sexually transmitted diseases, when we look and we see, again, I'm not sure the correlation here, but when we look and we see that McDonald's restaurants are outnumbered by adult bookstores by the ratio of three to one. I'm saying to you, it's a strange land. It's a strange land when we look at everything that we've held dear and we dare to proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And instead of the message being honored and respected, it's being marginalized. And the church is now under the delusions of the spirit of Antichrist. It's a strange land. And there are those moments when we look at the way culture is going and we look at so many weak and pale and anemic churches and we have at times probably felt like throwing up our hands and saying, what's the use? There's no more reason to sing. There's no more reason to carry on. We might as well give up. Simply hold the fort and, and try to maintain. Let's throw it all in. Let's just forget it. Let's just go the way of all the world and compromise. But my dear brothers and sisters, it is at that exact moment that all of a sudden, through God, through His Word, comes crashing in and the Lord says to us, yes, it's a day of vulgarity. Yes, it's a day of vileness. It's a day of wickedness. And it seems that you're trying to live out the Christian faith in a place of confusion, in a place of captivity. But I want you to take your harps 
down from the willow trees. It's time for you to sing once again the song of redemption. It's time to sing the song of confidence because I have not changed and your victory can still come. And I've come to tell you this morning that God wants us to sing. He wants us to sing the song of Job where Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand upon the earth in the latter day. And though the skin worms destroy this body, yet my flesh, with my flesh I will see God whom I shall see for myself and that not another. Though my reins be consumed within me and mine eyes shall behold, my eyes shall behold a king in all of his beauty in a land that's afar off. God wants us to sing the song of Moses when he sang, I will sing of the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He is my God, and I will build him a habitation. He is my Father's God, and I will rejoice. He wants us to sing the song of Deborah the judge when she says, listen, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing a song unto my Lord and sing a song unto to God. He wants us to sing the song of David, where David sang, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. And yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He wants us to sing the song of Isaiah, where he, Isaiah said, The young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not go weary. They shall walk and not faint. He wants us to sing the song of the Apostle Paul when Paul said, Who can separate us from the love of God? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. It's time to sing the song of John. Whosoever is begotten of God sinneth not, for he keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. It's time to sing the song of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory and power and dominion forever. It's time to sing the song of the church. Sing the song of the blood. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But how do you sing the song of the Lord in a strange land? The Lord reminds us today that the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. He reminds us, fear not. I have redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall a flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Give me just a few more moments and I'll be done. It's amazing how many things you think would steal your song, but they don't. I don't like sorrow. Recently in my church, we had three people die within a week. We wept and we cried and we hugged and we held hands. I, I don't like sorrow. And yet somebody would say, oh, sorrow, that'll steal your song. Sorrow's bad. It's painful. But sorrow doesn't have to steal your song. I want to read a verse to you that may not seem like it has anything to do with this, and then I'll explain. In Matthew 26 and 30, it reads, Jesus and his disciples it's speaking of, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now here's what was about to happen. Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross. He had just come from having what we call the Last Supper, the Passover meal, the Passover feast. 
And in an atmosphere of betrayal, where Judas had gone out into the night ready to betray him, and Jesus knew that everybody would eventually forsake him and flee. He was headed for Gethsemane that would have sorrow upon sorrow, getting ready to go to the cross where they will nail him to the cross. They will have put crown of thorns on his head. That's sorrow. But in the middle of it all, did you catch what they did? They sung a hymn. They sung a hymn. And I'm telling you, sorrow doesn't have to steal your joy. Suffering doesn't have to steal your song. In the Word, you'll read of a man named Paul. And I'm sure you've heard of the Apostle Paul. He had a companion named Silas. They were in the city of Philippi. They had been beaten with rods within an inch of their life. They were locked up in chains and stocks in prison. That's not a happy time. But about midnight, in their suffering, I'm not sure how they started it, Brother Renee. Maybe they sang that Filipino song. I don't know. Probably not, but you don't know. It doesn't say. They could have. And by the way, I want you all to come back to my church next week or week after next and teach my church that song. Pastor Renee said, you teach your church, you sing next week? I said, oh, no. You all come and teach my church that song. Maybe that's what they were singing at midnight. I don't know. But whatever it was, something happened. About midnight, they begin to sing the praise of God. And God sent an earthquake. And he opened the jail. And on the way out, Paul got Mr. Jailer and Mrs. Jailer and all the little jailers saved and baptized before breakfast the next morning. Amen. Amen. Probably wasn't like the baptism we saw, but got them all saved and baptized before breakfast the next morning. What are you telling us this story for? I want to tell you that suffering doesn't have to make you lose your song. But what if you have lost your song? What if you do feel isolated, incarcerated, captive, tormented in a strange land? The way you make it is you keep clinging to the covenants. Keep clinging to the word and the promises that God has made you. Hang on to them for dear life. Now, I want to tell you something apart from this. My wife is very afraid of water. She would never have been baptized in water like that. She would have never helped in water. She would have stood on the shore and prayed for us. I tease her sometimes and say, you wear a life preserver to take a bath. Uh, and that's really not true, but I tease her. That's how much, you see. So I, I don't, it probably wasn't a baptism like we saw. But he got them saved and baptized. And, and when you have lost your song, when you are there, hang on to this for dear life. I mean, make this the, oh God help me, make this the book of choice. Make this what you read before you watch the news. Make this what you read before the newspaper or the newest novel. Cling to it. Hold it close like a dying person about to drown hanging on to a log. Hang on to it. That's how you make it. I don't care if it's American, Hong Kong, Philippines, China. Hang on to the word. Hang on to it with everything you've got. See, Jeremiah had not only predicted all of this would happen, but once the captivity took place, he even wrote letters to those who were in captivity. In Jeremiah 29, he told them, to those of you that are living in captivity, seek the welfare of the city. Go ahead and begin to live your life one day at a time. Don't stop living. Don't stop serving. Keep on going. There's going to be 70 years of this captivity, but I want you to live with hope. In verse 11 of the 29th chapter, he said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV translation says, Plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I want to tell everybody in here this morning, God has plans for you to give you a hope and a future. I don't care what's going on. God has planned to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future, my blessed Lord. If you don't remember anything today, I want you to remember that God wants to give you hope and give you a future. No matter what the enemy says, God says, I'm giving you a hope and I'm giving you a future. Amen. Amen and amen. Really, two minutes time me. Well, no, don't time me. Just take my word for it. 
So, instead of hanging our harps on the willows today and cashing it all in and quitting, some may be by a river of Babylon. And I want to tell you, isn't it interesting that some years later, by one of those same rivers that had been a place of despair, Ezekiel sat down and he said, I was sitting by the water there and I saw visions of God. Oh, listen to me. I know what the enemy says. I know the enemy says, you're here. You're away from home. You're away from family. Just, just quit. You're lonely. You're discouraged. Just quit. But I want to tell you something. By the very river of discouragement, God can give you visions of himself. God can give you visions of himself. What the enemy means to destroy you, God will tell you, look, I'll take that same thing and I'll build you up. What was it Joseph said in Genesis? Joseph, when his brothers came and, and they were being reunited, if you remember, Joseph said to them, said, uh, said, you meant what you did to me, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I want to remind you, the devil never means anything for good, but God can take what the enemy gives you, and God can say, I know what he meant it for, but I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll lift you up. Just sing the song. Sing the song of God. Amen, amen, and amen. Would you just pray with me? Father, I love you this morning. I pray, God, that whenever we're tempted to not sing your song, whenever we're tempted just to hang our harps and our voices on the trees and say, I quit, I pray, God, that you'll speak inside of us and remind us, just pull the harps down. Sing one more time. Sing one more time. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. We'll give you the praise and give you the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. amen.